I, I was asked to <laughs> present prizes at a, at a school prize giving day. Okay. And it was a special school. They were basically normal kids, but just like a bit lively. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them came from broken homes, and to be fair, they broke them. <laughs> <laughs> the school motto was Quiste Vede Este Amos, which means, Who are you looking at, toss face? <laughs> The knit nurse wore a gum shield. <laughs> and uh, I got there and this teacher came up and said, uh, have you got anything sharp or pointed on you? I went, oh, oh no, no, no. He said, oh, best have this. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Kennedy did it last year and they kept him in. <laughs> Gives you some idea, you see. And, um, so they sort of gave me a little bit of a tour around the school, you know, and there was this... Um, this was this work experience class and they were sewing mail bags over, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I said, uh, do, do, you, do you tell them the facts of life here? You know, do, you, do you give them sex education? He said, oh no, we don't want them to reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> and I was walking past this classroom and there was, um, there was a single kid in the classroom, you know, and uh, he was working away there and I, and I, put, I said, uh, are you okay? He went, oh no. What's the matter? He said, oh, I'm in detention, he said, I, I can't go to the prize giving. I said, well, what you doing? He said, I've been really naughty. Well, what have you been doing? He said, well, I've been pinching apples. <laughs> they won't let you go to the prize day for pinching apples. And there was a teacher passing, he went, go on, Cartwright, tell him everything you've been pinching, go on. He went, well, apples, IBMs. <laughs> The teachers were brilliant. They got through so much TCP. <laughs> Tea, coffee and Prozac. <laughs> and one of them had decided it would be a really good idea to hire a magician to entertain the kids before the prize giving. He, well, he must have had a, an aberration, that's all I can say, because it was Uncle Marvo. He hadn't got a clue. He never knew what hit him. <laughs> Uncle Marvo gets on and goes, Hello, boys and girls! Hello, it's Uncle Marvo! Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right, let's have some fun, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Me rabbit's gone! <laughs> and the teachers as one went, Brian! <laughs> and Brian came up with his rabbit, you know, and Brian was going, Af, af, af. And Uncle Marvo had this assistant, Gail, who was this very large woman, and um, she wore these fishnet stockings which she'd bought second-hand off the Grimsby trawler fleet. <laughs> I thought, I hope to God he doesn't saw her in half, we'll be here all bloody day. <laughs> so Gail goes out into the audience, she gets this little girl, you see, and, uh, and she's about nine or ten, and she brings her on stage, and Uncle Marvo says, hello, and what's your name? And, uh, Mandy. Oh, Mandy, that's a nice name, isn't it? Uh, would you like to do a car trick, Mandy? Have you done one before? No. no. Right. What I want you to do, I want you to think of a card. Could you think of a card for me? Right. But don't tell me. Now, you're going to tell me eventually what the card you're thinking of is, and when you tell me, it's going to pop out of this pack, it'll spin round, I'll catch it, and I'm going to give it to you. That'll be magic, won't it? <laughs> right, tell me your card. Huh? Mr. Bun the Baker. <laughs> and he didn't catch on. Of course, the next thing he does, he gets Gail and he puts her on this big round board at the back of the stage. And he said, right, boys and girls, I'm going to throw these knives at Gail. <laughs> and Gail is so brave, she won't move. All right. There were four knives in the board before he threw the first one. <laughs> Gail moved. <laughs> well, she pitched forward, actually. <laughs> and I thought, I hope he doesn't do that trick where he has to catch a bullet between the teeth. <laughs> 
So they get rid of Uncle Marvo, and then it's the prize giving, which is fairly straightforward, and um, it's great. Yeah, and the teachers do try very hard to meet the kids halfway to teach them something that will be useful when they leave school, you know. And there was a prize for best ransom note. <laughs> And a prize for best attendance, uh, which is probably least truancy, uh, but the winning kid didn't turn up. <laughs> and, and then at the end, they're great. I mean, they're, and, and these kids are tre tremendous kids. They re I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're a bit wild, but I mean, they, some of them are geniuses. They have these, you know, these genius things that, you know, that, and that teachers are trying to encourage them. There was this one kid called Mark who was brilliant at etchings. And uh, he, I had to go and see this etching. He was determined to show me this etching, you know. And uh, it was incredible. He'd, he'd, he'd done this etching of the, the skyline of Birmingham city centre, you know, with, with the rotunda and the bull ring and put all the, all the windows in and all the angles. It was fantastic. It was intricate detail. It was a wonder to behold. Unfortunately, it was on the side of my car. <laughs> you start to appreciate your own kids when you've been to somewhere like that, you know. And... Um, I suppose when I was at school, it was so different. I, I, I don't want to get into nostalgia here uh, because I just think the most embarrassing people that I meet right now are people who go on about how wonderful the past was, <laughs> and uh, which uh, I have to bite my lip here because I don't think it was. And um, in fact, when I'm down here in London, I can't believe the stick Peter Stringfellow gets. You give him terrible stick, Danny. And, uh, I mean, well, he's, he's a bloke who's my age, for a start, you know, and, and it's always, hey, that Peter String fella, hey, blimey, hey, bloke his age, running round in Ferraris, all them page three girls, hey, stuffing caviar down his throat, quaffing champagne, he's sad. <laughs> <laughs> no, he isn't. <laughs> he hasn't been sad since 1976. <laughs> Blokes of his age, five times a night, normally means going to the lav. <laughs> Wouldn't like to be him in the morning. He never wakes up in the morning. He never gets up in the afternoon. He sees less light than a potholer. <laughs> I've got trousers older than his girlfriend. <laughs> well, underpants if you pushed it. <laughs> I wanted to go to his club in London, Stringfellows, but they do that lap dancing. And I just have this vision of Michael Flatley. <laughs> All those people going, hey, oh, the 50s, what a great decade that was, hey, Jasper. Hey, we didn't have locks and bolts on the doors in them days, did we? We didn't have locks and bolts, no. There was sod all worth nicking, that's why. <laughs> He's going to miss six months in jail trying to pinch a mangle. <laughs> Going down the pub, I've got this mangle here. Oh. <laughs> got a tin bath in the van, have a look at it. <laughs> they don't make things like they used to, thank God. <laughs> nylon came out, I had five years of nylon, eh? Nylon jackets, nylon jumpers and shirts and nylon trousers and socks and underwear. Used to sit on nylon sofas, nylon carpets, nylon curtains. Used to sit in the lounge, the static electricity. <laughs> You could feed the national grid, you know. We all used to look like those kids off the Ready Breck advert, you know. <laughs> Dads used to get the kids and rub them up and down on the jumper and stick them to the ceiling. <laughs> Kissing your girlfriend was like snogging a cattle prod. <laughs> the only thing that wasn't made out of nylon were those woolen swimming trunks. <laughs> Looked like you've soaked up the entire shallow end, you know. <laughs> And entertainment, oh, don't give me that. Eh? I mean, Superman, I mean, we used to believe in Superman, for real. Oh, yeah. I mean, Superman used to do all these wonderful things all over the world. He'd be on every newspaper in the world. He'd be on television. And all he did was put a pair of glasses on and you couldn't recognise it. <laughs> How stupid can you get, you know? It makes you wonder about Chris Evans, doesn't it? <laughs> I bet if he takes his glasses off, he's Mo Molan. <laughs> And the Lone Ranger, the Lone Ranger and Tonto. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> he used to wear a mask so no one would recognise him. He used to wear a mask and a white hat and a silver horse, Tonto going round with him everywhere, and he didn't want to be recognised. 
If he took his mask off, he must have had the most ludicrous suntan. <laughs> Who's that panda sitting in the corner? <laughs> <coughs> and Stingray with that mermaid, Aquamarina, eh? What a figure. 38, 24, 7 and 6 a pound. Yeah. <laughs> And films, films had no realism, they were so bland, you know, you never saw Cary Grant coming out the bog and saying to Doris Day, I wouldn't go in there for a couple of minutes. <laughs> Things change, huh? but um, actually, the only, the only bit of nostalgia I ever really want to remember is that I actually featured on a Beatles bootleg album. <laughs> well, I was about 18 in Birmingham and I owned a Lambretta scooter, a 150cc Lambretta scooter with the raw, throbbing power of a lady shave. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I wanted to go to Sweden on it. <laughs> Birmingham to Sweden, and I only had three weeks holiday. <laughs> I must have been mental, you know. Uh, but I wanted to go to Sweden for sex. Because, uh, yes, well, in the early 60s, that's where you went, for sex. Because uh, Sweden was the place, you know. It's full of nymphomaniacs, and all you had to do was get across the frontier, and the border guards would wrestle you to the ground and have sex with you. <laughs> Hopefully they'd be female, but... <laughs> <laughs> and I took a mate with me. I took a mate called Derek. Uh, who was six foot seven and uh, about half as thin as me. <laughs> and uh, the idea was, I thought, if I could take an ugly mate, I'd have a better chance with the good-looking woman. Uh, and Derek came with me because he thought, if he took an ugly mate... <laughs> so, I was lead driver on this scooter. OK, so I'm sitting there, OK? And um, I've got one of them... Them parkers, them fishtail parkers, you know, because, like, I was, I was the original mud. Uh, all my clothes had M.O.D. stamped all over it. You know? <laughs> and I'd borrowed a crash hat from the next-door neighbour, you see, which is about four sizes too big, so I stuffed all my underwear in there, <laughs> which would save on the baggage at the back, you see. And Eric, Eric had borrowed this German army helmet off his dad, who'd brought it back from the war. So he's six foot seven with a German army helmet. But I'm there, Parker, helmet. He's two foot taller than me, German army helmet. All the luggage is above him and out here. We look like one of those motorcycle display teams. <laughs> we had the aerodynamics of a block of flats. <laughs> so we decided to go to Sweden. And uh, we had to have our passports uh, uh, done, obviously. And we had to have our photograph taken. And uh, it was all new in them days. And the photographer said, uh, look a bit dead. Pardon? Oh, it'll be easier to identify you. <laughs> um, and when we were filling those forms in for the passports, where it says next of kin, Derek wrote down Gene Pitney. <laughs> What's that? And he said, well, his mum's a big Gene Pitney fan, got all his records and never met him, you know? And if anything did happen, well, Gene Pitney breaking the news would sort of soften the blow. <laughs> This, Gene, this image of Gene Pitney ringing his mum's door and his mum opening the door going, Gene Pitney! Ah, oh, your son's a bit... Uh, oh, come in and have a cup of tea. <laughs> so we start off, we start off and, um, from Birmingham and we're in the street and all the street, all the street are waving us bye-bye, you know. And we're going to Sweden. This is a big deal in the early 60s. And uh, we went past number 15 and waved, and number 17 and waved. And we got to the end of the street, about number 45, and it was dark and all the bunting had come down. <laughs> but we're going as fast as we can. And it took us four hours to get to the beginning of the M1. Right? And it was pouring the rain because the, the more rain that we soaked in, the slower we got. So we got onto the M1 in those days. And uh, we were travelling now about 33 mile an hour. Uh, and I managed to slipstream a lorry. And so we went up to 37 mile an hour. <laughs> and then this other lorry comes up behind us and jams us in. I, and they thought it was a great laugh, you know. And, and where the hell we were going, I hadn't got a clue. <laughs> and every time I tried to get away, Derek wouldn't let me because the heat from the engine was keeping him warm. <laughs> so we get down to London and we get hopelessly lost. Hope we haven't got a clue where, you know, what London's about. And I'd see this car with a GB plate on and I thought, ah, he's going to Dover. It's the way you thought in the early 60s. You so I followed him and about 10 minutes later he turned into his drive. <laughs> 
this is not Dover Docks, is it? You know? So then, then, 3 a.m. in the morning, we are lost in Soho. Okay? We are lost in Soho. And I never forget going past the Peekaboo Club. Okay? There's me with this sodden bloody thing around me and the um, hat and uh, all the underwear dangling down, you know, and Eric with his German army helmet. And two ladies of the night, who were fairly desperate, obviously, looking at us and going, <laughs> Looking for a good time, dearies? And Derek said, No, Dover! <laughs> so we took the ferry, we got over to Belgium, and we knew nothing, we were so green. I was in a restaurant, I ordered a bottle of carafe. <laughs> we got lost in this little Belgian village, and because Derek was wearing his German army helmet, the mayor surrendered to us. <laughs> get back to my original statement. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. We decided we were going to give Sweden a miss, you know, and uh, we thought, well, by the time we got to Sweden, we'll have probably gone through the male menopause. <laughs> so we abandoned plans for sex in Sweden and reverted to plan B, which was Hamburg, the Reaper Barn. And it's Hamburg's equivalent of Soho. It's this big, long street full of red lights. And I thought, it'll take us ages to drive down there by the time this lot have changed to green. <laughs> anyway, the first club we came to was the Star Club. Right? And we went in, and on stage was this group called the Beatles. We hadn't got a clue, never heard of them. And anyway, I'm too busy staring at this big-bosomed, near-naked Fraulein. Uh, but what's more, she's staring at Derek. <laughs> and I can't believe it. She starts to take Derek, the ugly one, by the hand upstairs. Obviously, I know what she's after. And that's why if you listen very carefully on the Beatles bootleg album, you'll hear... Get your hands off Derek's helmet! <laughs> it's been a hard Have you ever looked at yourself and realised how ordinary you are? I have. I'm so ordinary, it's extraordinary. <laughs> I'm middle-aged, OK? I'm middle-aged and middle-class. I'm middle-aged, middle-class, and I live in the Midlands, in the middle of England. <laughs> in fact, I'm middle-aged, middle-class, and I live bang smack in the middle of the Midlands, in the middle of England. I drive a middle-of-the-range car down the middle lane of the motorway, listening to middle-of-the-road music. When I get back to my middle-class home in the Midlands, a home which was built, by the way, in the Middle Ages. <laughs> I listen to some more middle-of-the-road music on my MIDI hi-fi, usually Bette Midler. I'm not highbrow, lowbrow, I'm middlebrow. To fight off middle age spread around my midriff, I play midfield for a middle-of-the-table football team in the Midlands League and do a bit of middle-distance running. <laughs> Can't get away from it. When I go to the shops, I get a middling amount of money out of my Midland bank account, <laughs> my mid mid-term, middle-interest savings account, and then pop into Midhurst Butchers and buy middle-back bacon. <laughs> and do you know what? I'm sick of it. I'm sick of being ordinary. I went to the doctor and he said, Ah, you're having a midlife crisis. <laughs> I gave him the middle finger! <laughs> but when you get to my age, you start to see things in a different way. You start to wonder about strange things, you know? Who came up with the term spending money? What other type is there? <laughs> and why isn't a building called a built? <laughs> No man is an island, true, although Pavarotti floating on his back comes pretty <laughs> down. If the north of broads are so broad, why do we need a narrowboat to go on holiday there? <laughs> what would William the Conqueror have been called if it had lost? Bill the runner-up? <laughs> I wonder about Crufts. If Miss World is sexist, why isn't Crufts doggist? <laughs> Not only do the judges sit there and ogle the bodies, they get to Copperfield as well. <laughs> it's demeaning to dogs. 
You wouldn't ask Miss Venezuela to go trotting round Olympia at the heels of an Anne Widdicombe look-alike in a tweed two-piece. <laughs> but they aren't real dogs at Crufts, are they? You get those little ones that look like paint rollers. <laughs> and those big, sleek Afghans with the long, flowing blonde hair and the lovely eyelashes. I saw the best of breed winner last year and I actually fancied it. <laughs> And why is it when you buy dog food, you always buy the flavour you like? <laughs> he doesn't want beef and liver in a savoury gravy. <laughs> he wants cat-flavoured chunks of postman's leg. <laughs> and I wonder what happens to all those helium balloons that get released and float up to the heavens. If God ever does finally decide to speak to humanity, He's going to look down between the clouds and go, You have failed to obey the rest of the world. All that I will need is tremble before me. I wonder if there is life after death. What? <laughs> is that granddad? <laughs> Apparently there is. I wonder about Star Trek. I saw Star Trek IV, The Final Voyage. Kirk and Spock had just been beamed through time into an intergalactic antimatter converter where they wrestled with space mushrooms that wanted to destroy the Earth with killer pollen. And at the end, it had that caption that says, any similarity to persons living on Earth <laughs> is purely coincidental. <laughs> Which brings me to the royal family. <laughs> the Prince of Wales, he wants to save the planet. Yes. Which one, his or ours? <laughs> and what does the Queen expect anyway? Of course you're going to have trouble with your kids if you name them all after pubs. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to wonder about this government. I mean, come on. The Labour Party used to look out for the common man, right? Now they've got Ron Davis. <laughs> He's out on the common looking for him. I don't believe that Tony Blair and John Prescott are actually best mates. I just can't imagine the Prescotts going round to the Blairs for dinner without Cherry Blair putting newspaper down. <laughs> the Prescotts are that sort of couple you meet on holiday and they say, we must keep in touch. <laughs> and they do. I bet Tony Blair has briefed that copper who stands outside number 10. If you see someone approaching who looks like a bull mastiff with a beer gut under each eye, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Obviously, Mrs. Prescott must find him attractive. But there again, men and women see sexuality in many different ways. For example, it's a well-known fact that women are at their sexual peak at 30, whereas men reach it during any episode of Baywatch. <laughs> And men have sex at the drop of a hat, which admittedly is great fun on a windy day at Royal Ascot. <laughs> and of course, women don't suffer from premature ejaculation. Well, neither do men. It's not premature for us, it's bang on time. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? I mean, men go to see strippers because they're perverts. Women go to see strippers because it's a laugh. <laughs> it's good to see a bloke gets his kit off and a room full of women burst out laughing. I thought it was just me. <laughs> Men stripping is Britain's only growth industry. All those blokes who used to be coal miners and steel workers have swapped their hard hats for nipple tassels. <laughs> There's a new organisation now, the British Union of Male Strippers. Bums. <laughs> Same as ever, one out, all out. <laughs> you see, men love showing off. Is there anything more vain than a man naming his sons after himself? What's the thinking behind that? Take Ian Paisley. Sorry, take Ian Paisley! <laughs> his full name is Ian Kyle Paisley. He has two sons. One's called Ian and the other's called Kyle. Now, what does that tell you about him that we don't already know? <laughs> and how about Nigel Lawson? He named his daughter Nigella. 
Now, if Salman Rushdie had the same idea... <laughs> Salmonella. <laughs> what possible excuse is there for giving your kids the same name as you? There are hundreds of books of names. All your friends have got suggestions, plus whatever TV shows and movies are around at the time. If you don't believe me, ask my daughters. R2, D2 and Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> The only time men show any imagination for names is when it comes to euphemisms. Euphemisms for you-know-what. Yeah? <laughs> A bit of the other. Slap and tickle. <laughs> Anything but the word sex. There, I've said it. We can't say sex. Men can't say sex. It has to be things like, get your leg over. <laughs> get your end away. Get your oats. Get it off. Get it on. Get it up. <laughs> Men don't make love. They shag. Shack, <laughs> screw, score, knock, knob, boff, bang, ball, hump, jump, poke, pull, pull, <laughs> park the pink bus, <laughs> sink the salon, plant Percy in the playpen, pop the pink, root, rut, roger, ram, lay, top, mount, do the Roman helmet rumba, <laughs> have some anky panky, bit of as your father, slip a length, jerk in the gherkin. <laughs> Slamming the lamb, lead the llama to the lift shaft. <laughs> and breasts aren't breasts. If you're a man, breasts are bristols, dumplings, lotties, mambas, mammaries, melons, mazumas, mangoes, coconuts, jugs, jubblies, pears, pineapples, palookas, bazookas, charlies, hooters, threatening bits, teats, titties, diddies, sunnies, screamers, whoppers, wobblers, knockers, nellies, norks, shoulder boulders, airbags, fun bags, jelly bags, bats, bazoomers, bazookas, guns of Navarone. <laughs> but we really excel when it comes to the place where we park our brains. <laughs> it's not a penis, it's a Hampton. It's a happy lamp. It's a lunchbox, a love truncheon, a pork sword. Peter, plonker, pecker, pink cigar, pirate of men's pants. <laughs> Person, packet, pocket rocket, pink thermometer, rhythm stick, fleshy flugelhorn, gherkin, cucumber, carrot, ah. <laughs> Giggle stick, giggling pin. The right honourable member for underpants. <laughs> it's a joystick, a jigger stick. John, John Thomas, bacon bazooka, a beaver lever. Rod, <laughs> chopper, dick, donger, the bald-headed hermit. <laughs> Doghorn, dingling, wick, weapon, wanger. Wedding tackle, manhood, member, high-pressure vein cane. <laughs> old man, old fella, one-eyed trazer snake. A phallus, love sausage, captain sausage, Mr Stiffy, tadger, todger, wang, weenie, spurt Reynolds. <laughs> And those are the things you can say on television.